My name is Aaron Kotmanski, and I'm an archaeologist with PennDOT. I started a few months ago, and for some time I've been involved in cultural resources management. But I started my archaeology career with the West Point Foundry, and that's what brings me here tonight, leading, helping lead this IA online discussion, session 15, with Steve Walton here. My interest with the Foundry goes back to my time at Michigan Tech. As a graduate student, I focused on the blast furnace at the West Point Foundry, and after spending some years actually living in the Hudson Valley after graduating from Michigan Tech, continued to have interest in the Foundry, and then more recently uh, led the lead author on a National Historic Landmark nomination for the Foundry, along with helping put together American Society of Mechanical Engineers a nomination for the site as a historic engineering landmark, which took place two years ago. And so with all of these things coming to head and some more research avenues opening up and Steve and I collaborating on some things, brought us here tonight. So glad you're here and glad you are listening to our, our recording. Hi, my name is Steve Walton. I'm an associate professor of history at Michigan Tech. I've been working on the West Point Foundry since about 2002 when Michigan Tech started doing the archaeology there, although I actually had moved to Penn State for a few years while that was happening. Now back at Michigan Tech, I'm teaching in the Industrial Archaeology Program, and I'm also the Executive Secretary and the Journal Editor for Society for Industrial Archaeology. Aaron and I have been working on and off on the West Point Foundry for 15 years because both of us find this an absolutely fascinating, fascinating story to tell. As you'll see here in the slide, one of the things the way in which Steve and I decided to frame this talk was the ways in which the West Point Foundry story can't be told without talking about its archaeology and talking about its history. And we're going to see a little bit later on why that archaeology is so important and also why that history and the primary sources that tell that story are so important. So next slide is all you see. Yeah, not quite. I want to mention this. The two pictures here are two details from John Ferguson Weir's painting, The Gun Foundry, which is painted at the West Point Foundry in the foundry. And they're on the left side, they're casting a cannon with the, from the, the crucible. And on the right side, you can see, if you can see my arrow here, there's a whole contraption here. We won't go into details, but that was cutting edge technology for the day for cooling the core at the time. But it, this really does nicely highlight the archeology, span sort of the industrial actions happening, but then the history, because there's a viewing group there, including Gouverneur Kemble, who was the founder of the foundry, and probably his sister Mary, and possibly Robert Parrott, who was the superintendent at that point. And so it, this one painting, which is much bigger, it's a huge painting, nicely encapsulates this sort of dual nature of the place. But more importantly, for those of you of a certain age, you'll remember the idea of two great tastes that go great together, right? <laughs> and this is not peanut butter and chocolate, but we know that peanut butter and chocolate work really well. And I just want to emphasize that when we talk about archaeology and history colliding, that's not necessarily a bad thing, much like Reese's peanut butter cup. Note to Reese's, feel free to send the sponsorship money in. Aaron and I firmly believe we really can't do this project without telling the story of the West Point Foundry, without talking about the archaeology and talking about the archival history, because the two complement each other so wonderfully well. So with the foundries, you're going to see tonight lots of images of its past and some of its present and what it looks like. And so just to get us started here on the, on the left, you see is a actually from a letterhead from the very earliest days of the foundry, which began, which begins life in 1818 in terms of actual work. Corporate organization begins a year or two earlier, construction in 1817. And then we fast forward about 50 years, 40 years later into the 1860s, where you see the foundry here during just after the Civil War, 1860s, maybe early 1870s. So this is just a frame up to see like how we go from a period in which the foundry can only be depicted and recorded in, in a kind of a print way, and then we're moving into photography and a more rich document base from which to draw. So next slide, Steve. Space and time. Again, West Point Foundry really starts in operation by 1818 and hangs in just shy of a century, about 1911. 
Its last few decades were a little checkered, like many industrial enterprises in the US that were kind of multifaceted. The latter part of the 19th century was a struggle from the panic of 1873 onwards. We won't get quite into that era in too much detail. We're going to focus on the foundry's most successful decades from its beginning up through the Civil War. And then added here in, in parentheses, 1989 to 2021, 1989 in particular, because that's when some archaeology, not on the foundry in particular, starts happening, but on uh, nearby super fun cleanup that took place in Foundry Cove that Steve is uh, circling with the cursor right there. So we're talking, this is in, for those not familiar with the site, this is in the mid-Hudson Valley, and it's often termed the Hudson Highlands, the uplifted area of, of topography and geology, which is very remarkable. If you can get yourself there, go there. The West Point Foundry is referred to as West Point because it's opposite or in the area of what was historically called the West Point of the River, of course, just opposite it on the western shore of the, the river is the United States Military Academy at West Point. The two share a name, but of course the academy tends to be much more associated with that West Point name. In the middle, this is a period map done by John Bevan, dated about, eight, about 1854, but this map helps show the foundry at its just reaching its most prosperous, most influential time. And this map has been really used for us to do a lot of the archaeology at the foundry. And in the lower corners, leave off here with the office building that the foundry built for itself at the very end of the Civil War in 1865. Where exactly how they organized the funds for it, not entirely certain, but it very well been from profits from the contracts that they uh, fulfilled for the U.S. government during the war, for the Navy, and for the Army. Rolling on. So a little more detail, a little more zoomed in here. This is a, the earliest Sanborn fire insurance map from the foundry from 1887. Although it's a couple decades after our period of, of intense interest, it does capture pretty cleanly the, uh, the layout of the foundry. And as though, those of you who might be familiar with Sanborn maps, you know when they're colored in, that has a coating. Red is for brick, blue is for stone, and yellow is for frame structure. So this gives you a sense of how the foundry had to contend with a pretty constricted space. What I didn't mention in the slide before is that they're largely dependent on water power. They're drawing water from what was originally called Margaret Brook quickly renamed Foundry Brook, and they're running the water through a series of channels, and a, you see listed on the right there, it's depicted as mill pond. We often refer to in the archaeology as battery pond. Water is drawn off there and is channeled in a, in a raceway to a 36-foot diameter, 8-foot wide backshot water wheel. And we'll see a photo of that here soon. But that generated a lion's share of the power used in the foundry to run its boring mill, and perhaps some share of its machine shop, too, that you see about in the center of the, uh, the drawing. And of course, just above that is the foundry itself. So move on to the next slide. That water wheel I just mentioned is there on the left. This is in its, la its later days, pro probably not in use by this point. The light that's coming in that gives the photographer the opportunity to take the photo is not not good for the structure. It's actually at this point probably falling in, so it's allowing a lot of light in. There were skylights in use, so I'm speculating there's some, but other photos taken of that same show it in not in the best of shape. On the right is the interior of the machine shop during the war period, and you can see on the floor to the right of the, the photo are several parrot guns with their characteristic breech band supporting the, the, the rear of the gun. And you can see that the several machine shop tradesmen here leaning on the machines, probably happy to take a break or maybe miffed or both. For years, we, we misinterpreted this photo as being inside the boring mill. And a, um, a researcher with the Putnam History Museum, we're talking, he said, oh, no, that's actually the machine shop. Let me show you why. And there are other photographs of this that show it from different angles. And you can see how it's taken. And the windows you see in the upper right corner are the west elevation of the machine shop. So we're always learning. We're always reevaluating what we know about the site. It's a Rubik's Cube. We're constantly thinking it over. So next slide. 
forge work. They could also, one of the keys to how the foundry was so successful was apart from being able to cast metal, machine it, whether it's in a big boring mill or a machine shop, was their ability to forge large wrought iron work. In this case, this is John Ferguson Weir's painting from the 1870s of, called Forging the Shaft. The painting is featured in the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in Manhattan, and it's cousin of sorts, well, I guess a sibling is in Cold Spring, and it's the painting that Steve showed a couple of pieces of at the first slide. This is inside the, the blacksmith shop, as we termed it, or the forge shop. And here they're forging a large uh, shaft for a uh, propeller-driven marine vessel. <laughs> uh, up on the right, I, I, I found this article very recently. Newspapers.com has opened up a trove of material on the West Point Foundry recently. We can do a lot of keyword searching very quickly. It's a little funny piece here, um, not necessarily related to the Ford shop, but in the 1830s and 40s, the West Point Foundry was often noted in newspapers as having one of the largest trip hammers in operation in the U.S. We're not really into superlatives as much here as we'd like, we, we might, uh, others might want to be, but it is interesting to note, and here the New York Daily Herald took advantage of that supposed idea. So, next slide. For the West Point Foundry being this multifaceted cast metal, machine metal, put things together, whether it be cannon for the contracts it was filling, or filling for the Navy or making steam engines like marine engines. There were other shops like that around. There's a layer of novelty in Manhattan. There's uh, outfits in Boston. There's a growing steam engine building market here in Pittsburgh for Western rivers. Philadelphia is very strong. But the one thing that West Point Foundry did for a while that was pretty exceptional was have its own blast furnace. And from 1827 to 44, they had a furnace on site to make iron, to make pig iron, to be recast in the machine shop, excuse me, the foundry. And that may have been driven by quality considerations for the cannon contracts and fill. They had very specific specifications that the Navy and to a lesser degree the Army required. And so keeping good quality of pig iron was a box they had to check. The furnace is actually was the fo focus of my thesis research. I know more about that acre of earth than any other place on, on the planet. It's been really it's been an interesting place to explore. I wrote an article for our IA theme issue some years ago and was honored to receive an award for it, which is sitting up on the wall behind me here for the, uh, the Vogel Prize in 2014. And on the, just on the right here briefly is a, uh, a page from Frederick Overman's 1850 iron, manufacture of iron in all of its branches. And he upheld the West Point Foundry's blast furnace as, an, as a, uh, a furnace to be emulated. Interesting, books published in 1850, furnaces out of operation in 1844 due to a, a turn down in the market. Next slide. Side note of, of things we won't cover here, this painting is by a American artist, John Gadsby Chapman, and talking about the sort of breadth of studies that one can do tied to the West Point Foundry, Chapman was a close friend of the Kemble family. In fact, he rented William Kemble's house in Cold Spring a number of summers. William Kemble lived mostly in, in New York City with his family. And his the brother, Gouverneur Kemble, who I mentioned at the opening, was a huge art collector and, and tied into the art world. And so there's a whole nother set of outside the industrial story tied to this industrialist. Thanks, Steve. That's one of the things I, there's a lot to talk about in these 40 minutes. And there's some things we're, we're each going to not pay as much attention to. One thing I'm leaving much to Steve here, and I don't want to be any spoilers here, but is the, uh, the people who get this place going and, and keep it in operation and Gouverneur or Gouverneur, Kemble and his brother William were essential to its start. And then Steve's going to get much more into that here in a bit. So back to the operation of the foundry itself, of course, it is the West Point foundry. And then that means it's, it's part of operations is casting metal. John Ferguson Weir's painting, probably one of the most uh, celebrated pieces of industrial artwork of the 19th century, which is in the Putnam History Museum here depicts pretty cleanly how to uh, use an air furnace to cast, in this case, cannon. The two glowing holes you see in the back, those are from where, those are, well, those are ports from which they would draw molten metal from. In this case, it's more or less cast iron or pig iron that's been remelted. 
swing the jib crane around, pick up the metal, then bring it back into place and pour it into any of these vertically aligned flasks that are for cannon. In the bottom left of the painting, you can actually see what appears to be a nearly complete parrot gun, which is a bit of a, what's the version of a misnomer for a painting? We are probably included that just to show what a parrot gun would look like complete, but you probably wouldn't have a complete parrot gun in the foundry itself because that would be finished elsewhere. But he's doing it to tell a story, which is pretty interesting. And just briefly on the, the lower right there is this contraption that looks kind of out of place that's has water flowing around the core of the uh, casting. That's actually a process that Steve can go into much more detail than I can, but that's for a way to control the cooling of the casting, the tube of a cannon to ensure a uniformity. So it's not, it's much less likely to burst. And not all cannons cast at the foundry during the Civil War period were uh, done to that way, but they were done for some contract specifications with the government. Just in really briefly in the upper right here, is you can't really talk about a foundry without talking about the skilled tradesmen who made patterns, the carpenters. And that's a view inside the pattern shop that's very nearby where they would make wooden patterns for, the, uh, for whatever needed to be casted. Next slide. So this is a recap here of where we are. This is a, it's a long history. There's a lot of different ways to look at it. And so, Again, in, in like art, in artistic representations of the foundry and documenting ways, we go from a woodcut era to a, 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 a pen and, and ink era, in which in this case is uh, Thomas Keller Wharton's drawing of the foundry dating from 1832, which captures much of what you've seen here already, the foundry layout below by Foundry Cove, the blast furnace up the gorge. It's a really remarkable drawing that's very accurate and depicts fairly cleanly the, the state of the foundry as it's getting up into its most heady days. And then the photograph from the 1860s that gives a little bit more view and you can see how much infilled the site has become as as business has taken off, both for civilian contracts, for what we like to think of as capital goods, durable goods, um, uh, marine engines to make things move, and cannon, uh, which in the photograph is pretty small, but you can actually see several cannon tubes laying out by the, uh, by the cove of the foundry. All right, next slide. The foundry was a known place in the national imagination. And again, this is a way in which newspaper research can open this up a little bit. These are just a sample of, of clippings from the period and the things that uh, newspapers would pick up on. Of course, they're sharing stories around, kind of like the Associated Press does today or would come to, actually the Associated Press comes into existence during the Civil War. But here you see two stories five years apart on either side of the page about largest cylinder in the world being cast. Was it really the largest cylinder being cast? Who knows? But to whoever was writing on this, they sure felt like it was. And this one in particular on the left, Steve's going to talk more about this place, the Mount Savage Iron Company and its relationship to the foundry and why it makes sense why the foundry cast that cylinder. But to show how quickly their business is advancing, they go from making a blast cylinder of 126 inches in diameter, or that being 10 feet, six inches, to one being in the left and the right being 17 feet in diameter. So they're getting more assured of themselves. They're getting more confident in their abilities. So it just helps illuminate that. Article in the middle, middle is something I just found today. Another example of the foundry doing work all over the map, quite literally, they were beginning to develop water, water turbine uh, technology, or they were making it on contract, in this case for two uh, British engineers who had a patent here in the US for a Barker type turbine. We'll see another uh, image of a Barker type turbine later on here, so. Next slide. Marine engines. So the West Point Foundry gets a, a, a big shout out in railroad circles because they made some of the very first uh, American made steam locomotives in 1830, the best friend of best friend of Charleston for the Charleston, the South Carolina and Hamburg Railroad. I always butcher the name and several others thereafter. And they were in that game somewhat in the 1830s. Things get strange after the panic of 1837. But at the same time they're doing that, they're beginning to make 
steam engines for river transport, for coastal trade, and also for some ocean going. On the left is the Lexington, which if you know your steamboat history, met a pretty ugly end in January of 1840. The West Point Foundry built its engine. The boat did not blow up or catch fire because of the West Point Foundry's engine in particular, but it was a prominent uh, steamboat for its time. It was in operation for about five years on the very competitive Providence to New York line. And on the, uh, the right is this another newspaper article. This was from Davenport, Iowa, if I recall right, but it a, um, shows the schedule for a uh, Buffalo to Chicago route and includes a boat with a West Point Foundry engine. So. Next slide. So they stay in the marine engine game well enough into the 1850s that they snag a pretty a serious contract with the Navy. The early to mid 1850s, the US Navy, its leadership is watching what's happening in Britain and France with some interest and they decide to build a class of six, I believe, steam powered frigates updated with shell guns and steam power. And each of those vessels has a steam engine from a different maker, if I recall right. The USS Merrimack, launched in 1854, has the engine of the West Point Foundry. It's a lever action, lever side action. I'm going to butcher how it's called. It's, anyways, it's, it would take a whole 20 minutes to explain how it works. But the blue outline you see is the piston itself. And there were two of them that acted in counter to each other. Similar to the way the engine of the monitor will operate a side lever, vibrating side lever engine. There we go. Steve might be trying to find an example of one there. I'm not sure. There. So pretty fascinating, but this is a great find. This is the National Archives. A researcher of the Merrimack, of course, it's going to re-enter history during the Civil War in Virginia. Stephen Kinneman wrote a more or less a biography of the Merrimack. Pretty great book if you're into mid 1850s U.S. Navy history, and he had found that in the National Archives and was um, gracious enough to share it with me. Next slide. Civil War years. So, 1859. Of course, the foundry, along with its civilian contracts, is continuing on making guns for particularly Navy for third system fortifications, less for the army. Of course, that story is going to change in 1860 with Parrott's invention. But in 1859, they make a batch of 11-inch diameter Dahlgren guns that sit around until two are called into service to be mounted aboard the USS Monitor in 1860 and 61. Of course, they see service in the Battle of Hampton Roads. I'm not going to steal Steve's often quoted line about this, but when the, when the monitor's turret was recovered, they found how they were uh, etched here after the, after the battle, Warden, Monitor, Merrimack, and you can see in the lower right corner, WP number 27. So that's, of course, for West Point. So, and once more, Steve, let me hit the animation here. The Parrot Gun, which is Robert Parrot, who comes in as a superintendent of the foundry in 1836. Perhaps to relieve Governor Kemble of his duties of running the foundry so he can go off to Congress. That story is speculation, but Parrott stays on after his time as a commissioned officer in the Army, artillery officer, graduate of West Point in 1824. And in 1860, he patents the eponymous gun that's associated with him. And that gun comes in many calibers, but basically the same design cast iron tube with a wrought iron breech band to reinforce it so you can fire a more powerful shell. In this case, if they're rifled guns, so they can fire a heavier shell farther than you could with a smooth bore. And they would test the guns at the foundry before they would be shipped. In this case, on July, no, May 1st, 1864, this crew is testing a 300 pounder Parrot at the foundry. They would shoot shells across the river to proof the guns before they could be taken on by the government. So the idea being they proof them as close to home as possible. If one burst, they wouldn't be charged the freight, I believe. But I'm not sure how exactly that works. Steve can probably speak to that better, not you. Well, and this is also a good example where the archaeology has given us more information. Mm -hmm. The Superfund archaeology from the 80s under Grossman excavated, uh, maybe not this one, but one of the gun firing platforms. 
So we knew that they existed, but when they did the whole area, we got a lot more information about how the, these uh, firing systems worked. The other thing I'll say just is a reflection there of archaeology meeting history. In fact, we always say that Parrott invented the gun and patented it in 1860, but there is documentary evidence from Governor Kemble writing to the, it's the Army or the Secretary of War saying, we propose to invent this cast iron gun with a wrought iron breech ring shrunk over it in 1842. And the Secretary of War endorsed the back of that letter saying, sure, go ahead at your own cost. We'd be happy to see it. So the idea has, was around. That little tidbit is stuck in the, the manuscript record. There's plenty of these guns around. Visit any Civil War battlefield. And then we know the, the full history picks up from 1860 onwards. They go out of use very quickly because they're actually not the most reliable guns. Although as Civil War guns go, they're not bad. The West Point Foundry itself is pretty interesting that, that it's a survivor of its period. It's not, there's not many of these types of sites around. It was of a certain, of the, those that can make Canon that the government was accepting was a small class in the era leading up to the Civil War. The number four is often bounced around, that being the South Boston Ironworks in South in Boston, the Fort Pitt Foundry and the McClurgs here in Pittsburgh. Two different operations in Virginia earlier, the Virginia manufacturing something, something in Richmond, I'm missing. And then later, of course, in 1837, Tredegar comes on, comes in. And I feel like there's someone else I'm missing that would sometimes be a player in the contracts. But what these sites all could do, they can make cannon, but they also participated in civilian markets for, like I said, like various types of machinery and both for motive power, but also making things, different machine tools. And so, but the foundry, the West Point foundry is one of the few of these that still you can visit. South Boston Ironworks is now an MB, MBTA yard. Fort Pitt here in, in Pittsburgh is a parking lot with very little archaeological potential. It was redeveloped multiple times over. Saw later use under Macintosh Hemp Hill as a, a maker of uh, mill machinery. And with a big chunky piece of IA actually behind it there, the Pittsburgh, Fort Wayne, Chicago Railroad Bridge hanging out, but um, not much to be said for the archaeology. There's, of course, an exception I just mentioned is Tredegar in Virginia and Richmond. However, the one thing about Tredegar and Pat Malone is here with us tonight, and, and I, I believe I've had conversations with him and in the work that he, Bob Gordon, and Mike Raber did in the early 90s. I don't, if I recall right, there's not much pre-Civil War archaeology associated with the site. So Tredegar continued to have a successful run into the 20th century and much of the site was redeveloped leaving the West Point Foundry as a kind of standalone, an ultimo ombre of, of pre-war, antebellum, multifaceted foundry machine shop kind of places that were doing big, big contracts. So uh, even though there is Tredegar, and they do have some interesting things in tech, they're like the air furnace, which is pretty cool. The foundry has its own exceptions in that regard. Next slide. Okay, I'll take over for a little while and talk about the, the historical side of things. And the framing concept that I want to, to put forward is the idea of networks. Now, to us, this is not surprising at all. We live in a networked world, but increasingly historians are coming to realize that this is a useful phrase to think about, particularly business connections and technological industrial connections in the pre-late 20th century, that is, in our case, mostly throughout the 19th century. So let me start with the founder, in quotes, of the West Point Foundry. And by founder, I mean William Young, who is the man, the engineer, if you like, who is apparently most responsible for building the technical side of the foundry. Gouverneur and, and William Kemble brothers, they're both merchant class. There's no evidence either of them knew anything about the iron industry. They might have known the iron trade a little bit, but the industry they didn't know. So they had to hire an expert. They hired William Young, Irishman by birth, emigrates probably before 1817, but we do have a diary entry that we know exactly what day and what ship he showed up on. But that's when he was coming back with a whole gang of workers to build out the West Point Foundry, which they started in 1817, and it was up and running by the end of the next year. He stayed there until 1830 when he was lured upriver. So the West Point Foundry is there. 
he was lured upriver to help build the Ulster Ironworks in Saugerties, New York, on the west side of the Hudson, which is uh, primarily a rolling mill, iron mill. For the longest time, it didn't it doesn't seem like there's a connection between these two things, but the more you or I dug into the um, archival record, it turns out actually the Ulster Ironworks is mostly bankrolled by the West Point Foundry concerns, so the Kemble brothers and the consortium that's there. This is there's another story here of bringing in other experts uh, by the name of Travis, etc., to build this one out. Once Young is done with that, he then gets lured away to the New York and Maryland. Iron and Coal Company, which is Mount Savage in Maryland, which is out here in the Western Panhandle of Maryland, where he builds out in this case a rolling mill for, and he stays there for about five to seven years. Eventually he retires back to Cold Spring where he died in 54 and is buried, although we don't have his headstone. I just put this in here to note, it's very interesting. One really does need to check the genealogies of these people. Sometimes genealogies can get overwhelming uh, there's just so many people. But when you figure out, you know, who is William Young, and in this case, his wife, Kira, and the connections and things, there was another William Young in Cold Spring, which turns out is not this William Young, but in fact is his, I believe, cousin. There's Adam Young, who is his, we think, brother. A little dicey, but Adam Young becomes an important worker at the foundry, at the West Point foundry, and then goes on to do other things as well. So these networks of people, in this case, a family network, but also then a, an individual moving between spaces is very important as well. This is a view of the, the uh, Mount Savage works as it was built out finally. And this is the place that that cast cylinder that the newspaper article that Aaron has from 1845 is headed. And that is to go into the blowing engines, which power the furnaces in the back. Just to point out, these were remarkably massive furnaces. The ruins are still there. These are photogravure from the early 20th century. The Mount Savage Ironworks didn't last that long, but the furnaces stayed for a long time. And they're in much worse shape than this now, but they are still there. And would someone want to go do archaeology there? It'd be a great place. What's interesting is, and uh, you can read this on your own, pause the recording later for those watching on YouTube, the connections need to be traced out between all these people. And in some cases you can hinge on the person and then the Campbell brothers and their investment in the foundry. And then we now know the Ulster Iron Company. And originally that was investment question mark. And then we don't know for certain whether the West Point Foundry had any financial stake in Mount Savage, but there are other connections through people that lead there. Here's an interesting question is Weld and Howells. They're actually British investors in the 1840s that somehow bankrolled the Mount Savage Ironworks. And again, more work is needed. But fundamentally for the IA story, this is a technological through story. Those blast cylinders for the Mount Savage Ironworks are just one example, but the rolling mill for Ulster Iron Company made at the West Point Foundry. And we have questions of where some of the technology came in here with William Young and his workers probably from Northern Ireland, but we haven't been able to track that down completely. So just to show you the example of, of the kinds of things that are connected here, railway historians get excited about the, um, Mount Savage Ironworks because it reasonably has the claim to, the, to be the place that rolled the first iron rails in the United States, I think in North America, but certainly in the United States, even though Danville, Pennsylvania often takes credit in 45, because they sort of managed to, to, to succeed better. But where did this technology come from? Well, here's the rolling pattern book from the Ulster Ironworks of these, uh, a series of, of rolling rolls, I guess. I have to turn that sideways to see it. And of course, where were those built? At the West Point Foundry. Mm -hmm. The other connection, which is interesting to concern, this is a, a manuscript diagram by a West Point foundry engineer who's sent out to Mount Savage to install these blowing engines, you know, the main pipe things, the blast cylinders here. So these are where those cylinders from 1845 are going to, to um, blow these two furnaces. Just interestingly, they built two, they planned to build the third stack, but that one never got built. So this is what we're thinking about on the history side. The phrase that Aaron and I are, are going to be using is network capitalists, right? 
As we say, IA is about sites and technologies, but all those are made, operated, maintained, demolished by people. And so what are the connections between people? I highly recommend, although it doesn't mention the West Point Foundry nearly at all, David Meyer's book, Network Machinists, from about uh, six or seven years ago. Here's the description. In the Industrial Revolution, machinists in the Eastern United States created the nation's first high technology industries. In iron foundries and steam engine works, locomotive works, machine shops and tool shops, textile machinery firms, and firearms manufacturers, these resourceful workers pioneered the practice of dispersing technological expertise through communities of practice. These skilled labor exchange systems show how individual metalworking sectors grew and moved outward. The network behavior of machinists within and across industries help explain the rapid transformation of metalworking during the antebellum period, building a foundation of the sophisticated mass production slash consumer industries that figured so prominently in the later US economy. That is when we really blossomed as an industrial powerhouse. So this diagram here is just the, just the initial beginnings of the West Point Foundry. The two brothers, Governor and William, set up the West Point Foundry Association with a series of people, I'll show you a diagram in a moment, and they turned to a number of people. They turned to the military, and there's reasons for that, both practical and interpersonal. They turned to the government, and particularly a little bit later when Kemble becomes a congressman, connections flow, as you might not be surprised when they decide on the place, which actually they knew about, the family had um, mercantile connections in the lower Hudson already uh, in the 18 zeros and 18, early 18 teens. So they knew Cold Spring was there and knew it was a perfect place to, to start a water powered foundry. They turned to the locals for expertise. And we have diaries and letters which explain that they also knew they had to turn to international expertise because they didn't have it. So Hassler is Ferdinand Hassler, who was a geographer and mathematician at the West Point, at, uh, at West Point, the military academy, later becomes the founder of the Coast and Geodetic Survey. But one of the military commanders asks Hostler, can you get us some foreign books on metallurgy? Because we don't know, I didn't say it this way, but we don't know what we're doing. We need his expertise. And so when you look at these networks, and all I'm asking you to do here is look at the um, highlighted boxes. This is the initial West Point Foundry Association. They bring in a whole series of partners. This is not surprising. It's a joint stock sort of company. They sell shares to these men and their families, some of whom keep it, some of whom sell back very, very quickly, interestingly. And there are connections with West Point and things, but initially it's basically a mercantile ring. All of these people, the Renwick brothers, the Gouverneur brothers, which is they're related by family, the Swartwout brothers, and there's a third Swartwout brother who interestingly is part of the Mount Savage Ironworks, so that's a question, but not part of this one. Perry, Smedberg, and others are all mercantile traders. So it starts there. Then when you look at the much larger connection as it gets built out, all I simply want to point out is that there are multiple networks over, overlaid on each other. The green are the initial financial partners. The red are the various connections that bring in technical or financial expertise, the knowledge that can make this thing work. The blue are the, we'll call them government, but government slash military connections here. And then I also want to point out that there's an awful lot of just personal connections here. All the, almost all these yellow blocks are friends, most of whom went to college with the Kemble brothers, right? So it's, it's, it's really a remarkably tight knit society, if you want to look at it that way. And I'll have more on that in a minute. So what I want to do is look at three or four of the very important engineers who worked at the foundry, got their training at the foundry, and then their networks that flow outward from the West Point Foundry. Barnabas Bartol, very interesting person in his own right, born in 1816, apprenticed at age 16 in 1833, apprenticed to the West Point Foundry. His biographies claim that he wanted to be a a uh, foundryman and, and get his hands dirty as it were, whereas his father wanted him to go work in the drafting shop. But at any rate, he had a great aptitude and ended up being within a, a couple decades, one of the most important engineers in Philadelphia. But how did he get sort of that uh, to that point? 
At the age of 16, he's immediately sent with an assistant from the West Point Foundry to install a coal winding engine in Richmond, Virginia. He's then sent immediately to New Orleans to install the water supply system, which is being built at the West Point Foundry and shipped down there, both the uh, cast iron pipes and the pumping engine itself. The next year, he's sent up to Seneca Lake in New York, up in the Finger Lakes region, to install a beam engine on a little schooner that's just on the lakes there. So very small scale, but that marine engine stuff. At that point, we're at 1835. By 1838, he's sent to Cuba to install a West Point Foundry steam engine at a sugar plantation. And by 1839, at age of only 23, he becomes superintendent of the West Point Foundry. Eventually, though, he does gravitate to Philadelphia. Here you can see his Delaware Canal pumping engine built a little bit later when he's working for American Town. And Bartol also owns, guess what, a sugar importing company refinery in Philadelphia. Connections back to the Cuba connection. He also then becomes an important author, becomes the authority on marine boilers. He invents the so-called steam cutoff, which if you apparently read the history of steam engines, this 1844 invention makes steam engines just the next sort of quantum leap forward in, in the technology. It makes his name by that alone. Interesting side note, uh, some of these anecdotes get very interesting. One, for example, is supposedly, take it with a grain of salt, Bartol was offered the position of the chief engineer of the U.S. Navy during the Civil War by Lincoln himself. He's got to track that one down. But eventually decided it was better for him to keep working in Philadelphia building the new Ironsides, one of the breakthrough ships of the war. I just want to make one other interesting connection here that shows you, I mentioned the close-knit nature of these families. Bartol dies in uh, 1918, oh, sorry, I it was. Anyway, this is his uh, 1888 tombstone in Philadelphia here. But when you read a biography of Bartol that was written by his son, his son seems to say that Bartol went straight from Maine where he was born pretty much straight to Philadelphia and completely erases the West Point Foundry history. One wonders why that might be. It couldn't have been that bad because Bartol and his wife, Emma, named their daughter, Ellen Kemble Bartol. She married Brazier. And by the way, just as a, a fun thing, I made that gravestone rise up out of the bottom because Bartol's birthday is October 31st, probably. Um, the other interesting connection is that Ellen's mother, Emma, Barnabas's wife, was actually the daughter of the West Point Foundry surgeon at the time, whose name I don't remember. So, it, you know, you can call it incestuous or you can call it tight knit, either way. Person number two, quite quickly, Charles Haswell, again, gets his start at the West Point Foundry, does his apprenticeship there, becomes one of the most important engineers for the place. By 1836, he's working there and in marine engines, as you can see here, develops this Haswell's Engineers and Mechanics pocketbook. This, however, is the frontispiece to this mechanics pocketbook. And if you zoom in on that, what you see is we have a vertical consenting beam engine of a marine engine made by the West Point Foundry. And this book gets incredible praise. So everybody knows the West Point Foundry is going to be, or is, is one of these important nodes in, in engineering in America. A couple other, all of these people, you can pull out parts of their biography and say, oh, look what else they connect to. Look what else they connect to. So the USS Fulton is a, one of the most important side wheel steamers for the Navy. It goes under the captaincy of Matthew Perry, who you know is the one who opens Japan, but before that was the leader of the naval forces in the Mexican-American War. These, in this case, military naval connections for the foundry just continue. Another view of it there steaming in New York Harbor. And as I said, this pocketbook gets a lot of praise. These are testimonials in some of the later editions, as I noted, 72 editions by 1907, was it? All right. The Kembles, Robert Parrott, who takes over the West Point Foundry, and Bartol initially say, yep, this is a great book. Allaire and Malakvain, McGillivane, two of the major steam engine works in New York City do it. Horatio Allen, leader in American locomotive design, recommends it. 
can jump down these. Some of these others, maybe people that you know about that I've never looked into, but there's American Town, the people that Bartol ended up working for. Other examples here, various steam engine builders, Captain of the Ordnance Corps and a Totten. I don't know, but I'll bet you this is a Totten related to the Totten who was chief of the Ordnance. Probably his son, who's now a steam engine manufacturer. John Erickson, as in Mer uh, Monitor fame, who lived next door to William Kemble in New York City. Copeland, who I'll come to in just a moment, who worked at the foundry, but then he became US Navy chief engineer. And it just keeps going on. These, these recommendations keep coming in. All of them recognize the West Point Foundry. Two people to mention very, very quickly. Peter Lawson is a really interesting case because he's a inveterate patenter. He goes to work at the foundry in 1840 and he stays there for 39 years. Not a bad career in many ways. Various things tied him to the, the uh, lower Hudson. But if we need to look for who's inventing the mechanical stuff at the foundry in the decades leading up to the Civil War and just after, it's probably Lawson, but he's largely invisible in the archeological record, but very visible in the historical record. And then finally, I just wanna mention a local boy who makes good. Those of you who might be watching from the Cold Spring region know that Jaycox family is an old family in the uh, Putnam County area. Hamilton was born in 1836, probably one of the children of a Jaycox who actually physically helped build the foundry, shows up in the diaries. By 17, he was apprenticed as a machinery at the foundry. By 1858, he went to Cuba and became an engineer on the sugar estates for at least 11, some sugar estates for at least 11 years. But these are the estates that West Point Foundry is supplying steam engines, evaporators, etc. for. Eventually, he's going to end up at the National Tube Works in East Boston, and then eventually in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, at a foreman of a threading department. And so the point is, these Engineers that train through the foundry end up absolutely everywhere. Let me mention one non-person thing, but just an interesting side note that Aaron and I really haven't fully explored. In 1869, right after the Civil War, the West Point Foundry started up a place called the Kemble Coal and Iron Company, as you can see just south of Altoona in Riddlesburg. That arrow should be there, sorry about that furnace, poking ovens and things. There are some interesting breakthroughs technologically there as well. Frankly, they're trying to start to compete with what is just about to become the Pittsburgh Iron Mafia concern. They fail and lose it. What's really fascinating on the historical side is if you go to Riddlesburg, there's a big sign. All that's left are these coal and iron poking ovens. And there's a sign there saying, Kemble Coal and Iron Company was here for these dates. The name Kemble remains a mystery. Well, it isn't if you do the history. So here, for example, is a lovely stock certificate from Kemble Coal and Iron, signed by Robert P. Parrott, president. And even more, a name we wouldn't know, sending 100 chairs to Julia A. Durham, who's someone who marries into the Kemble family. So all of these people operate in the, the, uh, the concept of uh, a, a merchant, merchant collective, right, where you have sort of an extended family that runs everything. And so this is the conclusion I want to make. And then Aaron will finish up with some nomination things. This is what Aaron and I see as the great, great, great benefit of the collision of IA and history, right? The trick is getting into the lives of the people, the history, to help us understand the stuff, what we call archaeology. But to know who to look at, you have to know and dig in literally to what was on the site. And thus... The collision is not of peanut butter and chocolate, but I like to think of it as dirt and documents. So here we have, for example, the 2008, I believe, field crew. Sorry, Aaron, I couldn't find, I don't have a picture of when you were on the crew digging, in this case, at the foundry in the furnace room, I think. And here's me last summer transporting the Kemble family papers, 17 boxes worth, which also included my wife and uh, Susan West, who had uh, kept these in, in perfect shape for generations. She's the great, great, great granddaughter of William Kemble, putting it in my car and driving them to Albany where they are now at the New York State Library and Archives, with the exception of one box, which is specifically on the foundry and that is a Putnam History Museum. So the history is preserved. Aaron, if you wanna finish up, we'll call it a night. Sure, Steve. Yeah, that's one of the things I do wanna say now. 
I know that's actually uh, makes sense here in the slide is that we would need a whole other night or four to talk about all the archeology span that took place at the foundry. So I'm condensing work that spanned from 1979 till 2012, 13 until one slide. So it's not really fair, but just in, in very, very broad strokes. The foundry, its history goes out of sight, out of mind um, into the mid 20th century. Locals know about it. It continue, continues to appear in newspapers. But is it in the national mindset? No, not really, except for Civil War buffs and whatnot who know about the Parrot Gun. There are different attempts to uh, redevelop it in some regards. The silk works at one point in the 1920s, just a portion of the foundry. And in the 1960s, there's an idea of redeveloping the property as partly as a hotel with some nod to uh, interpreting the, the ruins of the site. That goes by the wayside for multiple reasons, but out of that comes a renewed interest in it, particularly as it's nine o'clock with the um, with the passage of the National Historic Preservation Act in 1966. And in the early 70s, some folks get together to put the put the foundry on the register on the National Register for the first time. It's going to be on the National Register a second time, and we'll get to that in a second. It's listed as a historic district. Its its significance is a little bit a little bit vague. It's the early days of National Register, and folks aren't really sure what to do with the document, but it gets into the, into the kind of federal mindset. Very quickly in the 1970s, interest continues to build to the point where surveys are done in, in 1978, 1979, by, led by Ed Rutsch, who was a, a leading figure in cultural resources management in New York, New Jersey area, um, passed away about 20 years ago and uh, still fondly remembered to this day. Uh, out of his work came a very chunky report, if you print it off about yay thick, that uh, those of us who did a lot of work at the foundry under Michigan Tech kind of thought of as like the, um, the uh, Old Testament of the history of the foundry. It's very rich, it's still a go-to source, it's great. Um, it would be nice to see it actually in some kind of publication form at the Putnam History Museum, so maybe that can come about. But some of the archeology span again was phenomenal in terms of what's preserved. There's a whole talk we could give about what you have, what you can get out of an industrial site when it's allowed to, when benign neglect takes root. You can bring in a bulldozer, grade a site down, redevelop it. That's what's happened in a lot of deindustrialized areas across the country, from Chicago to Philadelphia to Boston, you lose a lot. But the foundry, thankfully, although a lot of the buildings were salvaged, you still had much of the truncated walls, the innards of them where they operated. The foundry itself, as you saw in the photo that Steve just shared, the archaeology was done in 2008. Inside the machine stop shop is relatively intact. So work was done after Ed Rutsch. Fast forward 25 years when Michigan Tech comes in at the behest of Scenic Hudson Land Trust, who purchases the property in 1996. That was partly as an attack on to an ongoing Superfund cleanup that I mentioned of the Foundry Cove. It had largely become polluted with heavy metals from an adjoining operation. Marathon Battery Corporation was making cadmium-based batteries for aerospace applications. But the EPA sponsored a great deal of archaeology on some of the domestic sites of the foundry, and a lot of work came out of that. But the interest builds, and Scenic Hudson Land Trust purchases about 90 acres. And a few years later, they contact Pat Martin to initiate a program that carries on from 2001 to 2008 in terms of archaeology being done at the foundry to bring the story back up. And as several theses come out of that project, a lot of graduate Experiences are funded, thankfully, by Scenic Hudson, including mine. And I'm very grateful for it. And that's why I partly I'm happy to continue to be part of the part of the, um, the story. And then they continue to do interpretive work, which requires construction, which required monitoring. And some of the photos I feature here from the monitoring in 2012, in which they uh, mechanically excavated the uh, boring mill water wheel pit, which you see on the right, uh, which is quite an undertaking. So um, next slide, Steve. Start to get some more recognition. In 2010, the foundry is listed in the National Register for a second time, particularly for its archaeological importance. And in recent years, one of the things I've, I started talking with the former 
industrial history uh, coordinator with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, Dr. Terry Reynolds. And it's Terry, any interest in seeing if the West Point Foundry can be um, recognized as a historic mechanical engineering landmark? We talked, put together a proposal, and it happened. And Terry handed off that baton not too long ago to Steve Walton here. And two years ago, we had a dedication ceremony at the Foundry for recognizing the Foundry as the Mechanical Engineering Landmark. A brochure we put together is available online. Link can be shared later, but it was a really great project to put together and highlight other parts of the Foundry apart from its importance to cannon making, uh, which is um, an interest that Steve and I share about the place. So and now, next slide. And I should just say that um, sitting on the board of the ASME Landmark Committee, which if you search ASME Engineering Landmarks, you can find the brochure under it's think it's number 273. Or it's something. free. Yeah, it's free. Download. Yeah. Google, download. Um, this ended up being a, just a wonderful eye opener for the mechanical engineers and the president at that moment, I think past president of the society was at the dedication and, and realized this is the first time that we've ever landmarked a site that actually made two of our other landmarks. So Two other landmarks are the La Esperanza steam engine in uh, Puerto Rico and the Barker turbine down in at a different sugar mill in uh, Puerto Rico. So the these interconnections just keep cropping up and it shows you how important this place was in the 19th century. And finally, on Saturday, it's already been designated, but the ceremony to yeah. acknowledge the West Point Foundry Archaeological Preserve as a National Historic Landmark will be taking place on the Foundry Grounds at noon and Aaron will be there. Aaron? Uh, I will be and I'll, I, I've actually been given a few minutes to talk about it, so we'll see what I have to say, want something new. But uh, yes, in 2016-2017, uh, Scenic Hudson uh, Land Trust came to an agreement with the National Park Service on uh, recognizing the Foundry archeological site, the West Point Foundry archeological site as a National Historic Landmark. And for those who are not familiar, you hear these with this, how this works in terms of the tiering of the Park Service and the Department of Interior recognizing historic importance. You hear National Register. Well, that's a particular set uh, that comes out of the National Historic Preservation Act that comes in route in the 1960s. That's a lot of different sites. That's a whole, it's a whole, whole in story. A tier above that are National Historic Landmarks. Those are sites that have specific importance to, to U.S. history. National Register sites can be locally important, but perhaps not nationally important. And so the NHL nomination that I helped prepare along with a couple others in 2017 and 2018 helped uh, make the argument to the National Park Service that the Foundry deserved this highest recognition in terms of um, its importance to the, the nation's history. And so with some stalling and some committee reshuffling, we finally got to the point where we, about a year ago, we had a, um, a committee meeting and uh, the committee voted and they approved the nomination. And on January 6th of this year, I mentioned earlier, it was signed by the Secretary of the Interior as two uh, NHLs in New York State, the other being Grants Cottage uh, and farther upstate New York. And so, yeah, Saturday, we'll, we'll have a dedication. If you are in the area, you were absolutely invited to come. It's an open invitation. It will run from 10 a.m. till noon. Um, myself and my, my wife will be there uh, we're driving up tomorrow. And so uh, it's a great time of the year to be in the Hudson Valley. So I uh, really hope to see you there. Um, and there'll be a tour of the site also uh, after the remarks and the unveiling of the plaque. So it's a big day, pretty exciting. Um, it's always great to go back to Coltsman. And so we'd just like to thank, of course, SIA and Daniel for getting this whole series together. Scenic Hudson and Michigan Tech, obviously major partners here. Uh, I in particular, and uh, one of our former colleagues who was on but had to go, uh, Susan West, as I said, preserved those Kemble family papers uh, and her father before her and his father before him. And they're now all at the New York State Library and Archives in Albany, or what the one box very specifically on the foundry at the Putnam History Museum. We'd be very happy to hear from any of you on anything, but I see we also have some questions. So sorry we talked a bit, but you can tell we're passionate.